Good evening, everyone. My name is Emily Lefevers, and I am from the Miami University Alumni Association. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We hope after tonight's bourbon tasting that you will head on over to the virtual Charter Day Ball presented by Miami University Traditions. They have a comedian, magician, and a lot of student-created content for you to enjoy. Um, you can find the link to that event um, within the bourbon tasting event listing. So that you can then access the virtual Charter Day Ball through that link. So now on to the bourbon tasting. We are very excited to have Phil Collin back with us tonight. He is class of 2000. Um, Phil has hosted hundreds of groups on whiskey themed events, ranging from day long treks down the Kentucky bourbon trail to private tastings and educational seminars. Like Daniel Boone, Phil Collin believes that heaven must be a Kentucky kind of place. He has made it his mission to travel down every highway, byway, and back road, back road and no lane road in the bluegrass state while picking up as many great stories along the way as possible. After working in digital marketing in Cincinnati, New York, and Louisville, Phil traded in the desk for an office with a better view and has spent the last several years striving to show people a good time by sharing the history, culture, and business behind bourbon whiskey. Phil is a Louisville certified tourism ambassador and, a, and an executive bourbon steward through the Stave and Thief Society. Phil also serves as the, as the development manager for the Bourbon Country Burn, which hosts an annual three-day bike ride and whiskey festival at the Kentucky Horse Park in Lexing Lexington, Kentucky. And we are excited to have him back with us tonight to taste another three bourbons. Yeah. So there is an ask a question button below the video. I will monitor this throughout. So please feel free to ask Phil any questions you may have. Um, we will try to get to as many as we can. So without further ado, go ahead and take it away, Phil. Thank you, Emily. Hello, that was awesome. After that stellar introduction, I don't have a ton to say. Um, absolutely thrilled to be here. This is gonna be a blast. No better way to spend a Saturday evening with you fine people and Miami alumni. We're gonna, we're gonna have fun. There's truly nothing I enjoy more uh, than sipping bourbon and sharing stories with friends old and new. So, so good times, ahoy. We did this a few months ago. Um, back with new bourbons, new stories. It's gonna be a little different than last time, different experience. Uh, but we're still gonna still sip, sip some whiskey. So I know some show of hands. Who was here? Well, I I can't see you. That was there was no reason to raise your hand just then. But hopefully some of you did this before. We're gonna steer away from the very basics of bourbon and jump into more of the brands, lore, some risky whiskey stories, if you will, and history. Fun? Yes, very much so. And of course we're gonna we're gonna sip away. Um, from last time, we're gonna jump into the sipping a little sooner. Not make you guys wait before we broke open the bourbon. I invite you to connect with me on social media. Uh, last time, Emily could magically make my information appear on the screen, but if she can't, uh, you can find me on Instagram. <laughs> there we go. You can find me on Instagram at Derby City Phil. I'm on Twitter at Derby City Phil. Uh, feel free to email me. I love whiskey questions. I get emails all the time about Kentucky whiskey, all that stuff. Phil at Phil Talks Whiskey. I have a small website that you can go to also. This is great. She's Johnny on it. Uh, you, if you want, um, I'm always available to do this kind of stuff for different events, whiskey trivia, history tastings, uh, corporate happy hours, stuff, fun stuff like that. So feel free to check that out and drop me a line. If you've got your own great tasting uh, tonight and you're snapping away and taking a picture and you're tossing on social media, uh, tag me in your post. I love seeing what other people have set up for their own tasting and their own presentation. So yeah, so drop me a line anytime. Uh, connect with me. We'll talk whiskey and, and all that, all that fun stuff. Everything will be great. But let's get right down to business. Uh, let's talk about what we're gonna do tonight. Uh, Emily was kind enough to forward me some questions ahead of time that we got, so I'm gonna dig into those. I'm also gonna look for them as they pop up in the chat bar. I love questions. I always say that this is a dialogue, not a monologue, and I wanna make sure that you guys leave with a little extra knowledge or something that made the evening feel worthwhile and special. So as you can see below, uh, use the comments to ask your questions and Emily will do a bang up job of sending my way. So one question we got is, uh, I thought it's easily one of the biggest questions I get all the time, one of the number one questions that anyone always asks when it comes to bourbon, American whiskey, Tennessee whiskey. And we're not gonna really taste any Tennessee whiskey tonight, but this is one worth addressing. Someone said Jack Daniels and other brands label themselves as Tennessee whiskey. What's the difference? Uh, is there a difference? And why don't they just call themselves bourbon? And what a loaded question and a half, and I'll try to give it a short version. Jimmy Russell is the master distiller at Wild Turkey. He is a, a legend, the Bourbon Buddha. He's been there 60 plus years. He's 80 something years old. He's seen it all and done it all twice. And I happened to be there once and some people, visitors were gonna take a picture with him. And so I always used to say, hey, say whiskey, because it, when you say whiskey, it makes your 
heard your mouth go up and you smile. And he said, we don't say whiskey around here. That's a Tennessee thing. We say bourbon. Everyone say bourbon. And of course they said bourbon and their mouths all look like that. It kind of speaks to this friendly rivalry that we have between Kentucky bourbon and Tennessee whiskey. I say friendly in part because Jack Daniels, world's largest Tennessee whiskey maker, one of the world's largest whiskey makers, is owned by the Brown Foreman Company, which is headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky, where I am, about three and a half miles down the road. It's a lot of friendly kind of points and jobs. And essentially, Tennessee whiskey, bourbon straight whiskey, the same. The only key difference is that Tennessee whiskey is charcoal filtered, the process they do before it goes in the barrels, and they has to have, depending on how strongly you think the legal mandate is, a statement of origin that the product was distilled and aged in Tennessee. That's the basics of what makes Tennessee whiskey different than bourbon. Uh, but I've been in debates till 2 a.m. at the bar debating whether or not Tennessee whiskey, is technically bourbon, whether Jack Daniels and George Dickel and all those other great brands are bourbon or not. If, if you want some fun in your free time, if you want to really stir the pot, go into like a new bourbon Facebook group or go on Reddit and pretend like you're a bourbon doobie and say, hey there, fellas, I just got in the whiskey, see? And I'm hoping you can tell me the difference uh, between Tennessee whiskey. Is it a bourbon? Is it not? And uh, hours of enjoyment as they go back and forth uh, on each other and kind of debate you whether Tennessee whiskey is a bourbon. Product, enjoy Tennessee whiskey. It's not worth tasting tonight. So somebody asked, how do you decide what bourbon is to select for your tasting panel? question and it also gets us to the the, the drinking faster um a lot of what we do tonight is tricky because i've got people from all over the country you know 50 states puerto rico guam british columbia Saskatoon, and uh i want to make sure i can suggest bottles that are easy enough to find in any well-stocked liquor store and even the most sparse and least distributed state second when you're Providing your own whiskey, like you guys are. I wasn't able to send bottles to everyone. I want to make sure I could give you something that's affordable and a great value and tasty. So each one of these guys are going to taste it tonight. Could have run you between thirty and thirty-eight dollars at the liquor store. If you paid more, seven hundred fifty milliliter bottle. Either of these, condolences. You may live in a state with exceptionally high taxes, or you may have a retailer who's not particularly kind. And last but not least, uh, you know. Everyday sippers that are amazing for the cost. That's the theme of what we're doing tonight. Bottles that you can find just about everywhere are outstanding delicious. And if, if there's one thing I want you guys to walk away with tonight, one thing is that you can be a broke bloke and still have a great time with whiskey. None of us probably are in a spot where you can regularly spend $225 on, on a bottle this size of whiskey just because someone tells us it's, it's, it's the next great and wonderful thing. And you don't have to. There's whiskey out there for everyone. There's tremendous stuff. And so if your price point is in the $30 to $40 range, I've got a bottle for you. If your price range is $50 to $70, I got a bottle for you. If your price page is $26, I got a bottle for you. If your price is $12, go get some white claw and have a good day. Just about everything else is a price for you. So as I said, uh, please submit the questions and, and we'll get into that. We'll talk a little about the Kentucky Derby in a little bit. We're two weeks away from that. Uh, but yeah. One thing I always remark is make sure you have some water handy good palate cleanser between the whiskeys and it's always good to sip on some water to go. And when you're like me who's yakking away all night, it's good to have water. So you might want to have a small snack with you depending on what you like. Anything from kind of mixed nuts to chocolate. Anything else that will help you to clear the palate or accompany as you go. So I always want to make sure that you guys have water handy as we do it. Um, yeah, Some people like to go crazy with different dark chocolates or fancy pairings to get all fancy pantsy. However professional you want to get do you? That's the greatest thing about bourbon. You drink it any damn way you please, and, and you do it the way you want to do it. Substitutions more than welcome night. If you guys are drinking another bourbon that's not one of these three, I would love to hear about it. Drop a line in the comments, and Emily will forward this to me. I want to know what pleases your palate and what you've chosen to go with instead. Uh, as long as it's not uh, airball, for example. Uh, if so, if you're doing butter whiskey, you might have missed the point tonight's Miami University alumni session. Um, I used to make a joke. You, know, you never know who's going to be on the on the call. I used to joke that they uh, make fireball to each their own. Like what you like. Not a fan. If, I used to joke at the distillery how they made fireball is they'd start drawing a, a pentagram on the distillery floor and then they'd cut someone's finger and then they'd summon the devil and then he'd put his hand in a vat and the god awfulness of fireball was born. All right, let's start with Elijah Craig. Tonight we're drinking Elijah Craig small batch. Now, I know 
We did this one in the first session, but there's good reasons I'm bringing it back uh, again for this time. There we go. Elijah Kirk, small batch for me. One of the reasons, as I said earlier, is that for my purpose of tonight, every day delicious bourbons you can find just about everywhere. This one's hard to top. In just a minute, we're going to talk about consistency. First, we're going to pour. Everyone give it an open. Notice that all my bottles are pre-opened. I made the mistake before of doing these and having brand new bottles that I didn't open. I can tell you, nothing is less fun than doing these and watching the presenters struggle for 12 and a half minutes to get the plastic wrap off the bottle. We're tasting a little too much time trying to open the bottles. Okay. So each bourbon tonight, we did some toast last time in the Miami theme. I want to do that again. Uh, each bourbon tonight, I'm going to toast to uh, alumni or someone associated with Miami. Uh, this one... I wanted to raise a glass to uh, Philip Schreiber, Dr. Schreiber. I bet by bottom dollar that just about everyone who is associated with Miami on this call has some affiliation, perhaps affinity with Dr. Schreiber, whether it was your time there when he was president, I think from like 1965 to 1981. If you're like me, your time there when he was uh, president emeritus or still involved, or if you're beyond all that, just your time spent in the Schreiber Center uh, before and after it was the Student Activity Center. I, I loved having Dr. Schreiber on campus. His history of Miami course was one of the, the best uses of class time I ever had. And to date, uh, that annual story he told at Halloween about the Miami student who went missing. <laughs> no one could tell a crazy, well-told, haunting Latour ghost story than uh, Dr. Schreiber. So raising a glass to, to Dr. Philip Schreiber, too. All right, so back to the Elijah Craig. Oh, that's good. One thing I really like about Elijah Craig is its approachability. Now, I've said before, I don't like to get too much into the tasting notes. But what I mean is that if someone's relatively new to bourbon or they have a specific palate, this isn't likely to offend. It kind of hits all the right notes you'd expect in an everyday sip for bourbon. It's also, for my money, the right age statement. Now, for those of you who don't know, age statement means how long it was in the barrel before it was put in the bottle. Uh, the bourbon itself doesn't carry an age statement, I believe. Um, but I know and have on good authority that and bourbons over the age of four years, any bourbon that's been aged at least four years are not required to carry an age state. If they do it beyond that, they're trying to drag a little bit, like we'll get to the Russells a little bit. Uh, but I have a good authority that lately in the last little bit, it's been a mix of eight, nine, and 12 years. The reason I like this is the consistency. And by consistency, I don't mean just bottle to bottle and what you get when you go to the store, but the brand as a whole. And if I could go back in time, there are so many things I would do. But Elijah Craig, not so long ago, used to look a little different. It used to be called Elijah Craig 12-year, had a big old 12 right across the front. It was about the same price. And you could buy it for about 35 bucks. You could find it everywhere. And then all of a sudden, we found ourselves in the middle of this bourbon boom that we're in. And the Elijah Craig 12-year uh, got harder for them to stock, harder for them to keep in store. So instead of deciding to raise the price, they took the 12 year off and rebranded it as Elijah Craig small batch and mingled different barrels of eight, nine and 12 years. To their credit, they've done a great job. I think it tastes different than the 12 year. Sometimes I don't know if that's just my own perception and nostalgia missing the 12 year or whether this is only slightly inferior. To go to that kind of label change and makeover and still have mostly the same taste for the same cost, it's impressive, it's pretty well done. Uh, so like I said, if I could go back in time, I would have bought every single 12-year bottle it up that I had, and I took it for granted. I would have loaded the trunk with them, built a bunker, stored them in my bunker, and, and broke them out on a regular basis. So I'm thankful for what we have. We still have the Elijah Craig uh, small batch, which is a mingling of different barrels, 89 and, and, and 10 years of age. Branding's important. Brand loyalty is important. Uh, and I wanted to share a quick story with Maker's Mark. I was reminded of the other day, and what was probably – not probably. I'm going to say definitely the biggest urban marketing faux pas in the last 25 years. And the, the people behind Maker's Mark, the Samuels family, would probably nod and say, that's a fair statement. So it was about February, mid-February, uh, about eight years ago, 2013. And Maker's Mark was booming. They were doing everything they could to keep up with demand, especially international demand. They put out an email and they said, uh, great news. We decided we're going to make sure Maker's Mark continues to be available for everyone. Now, keep in mind... This is a product, again, talk about consistency, that red wax, that single mash bill, that straight across the board, had been unchanged at that point for the better part of 50, 55 years. Uh, and they said, we've got good news. We found a way to extend our supply. 
We've done a lot of uh, in-house testing. We promise you won't notice the difference, but we're going to lower the proof on Maker's Mark from 90 to 84. You'll love it. It'll be great. Eight days later, eight days later, because there was so much outcry, they reversed the decision and went right back to the 90 proof. We got sworn with emails, angry people, upset people, and they realized that you don't mess with a good thing. So that's an example of how the, the distilleries, the distilleries and their loyal fan base have to make sure they honor that consistency and don't push things too far. Um, I told that story and people have asked, so could you find the 84 proof bottles on shelves? I said, oh yeah, it happened fast. Thousands of them went on shelves. And people said, so they're like collector's items now? No, nobody wants them. <laughs> there's, a, there's a hands off. Don't get me near that 84 proof marker. It's my proof maker's mark. So that was a lot of fun. That's our first one. I told you we get to the drink a little quicker tonight, right? That's the Elijah Craig small batch. I'm going to have another sip because it, it's okay. This is my barware tonight. It's kind of just a standard rocks glass. This is one I prefer. I had a friend who gave me a gift, and it was uh, she's so thoughtful. It's this etched glass that gave me a set of four of them featuring four cities I've lived in, and this is the New York glass. So it kind of has the different, different things on there. Speaking of glassware, it's an exciting time in Louisville. We are two weeks, 14 days. The return of the Kentucky Derby being that first Saturday in May. Last year, they ran it in the fall. And uh, this is something I wanted to share with you guys because not only are we all excited for Derby around here, the glassware I'm about to show you is a great example of the dichotomy you find in, in Derby barware. It also speaks to the dichotomy you have in bourbons. You've got the pretension and the high end and the fancy looking bottle. And is it really worth it? The everyday, easygoing, good natured sipper. So many of you have probably seen this before. This is the Kentucky Derby official glass for the 147 Derby on there. If you go to Churchill Downs and you get a mint julep, it'll most definitely be served in this. And then all around the side of the glass, it has each and every 146 winners of the Kentucky Derby to date. I have friends and other people in Louisville who they you come a year, they can tell you the horse that won, the jockey, and some fact about that horse. We love our Derby right here. They have a crown by them if they're a triple crown winner. And a diamond if they're a filly, one of the female horses to have won. Uh, so that one you knew about. This is the pretentious I am. This is my favorite. This is a plastic cup that cost me about a dollar at the liquor store last week. And it is the official, sorry, the unofficial cup. It's all the losers, all the last place finishers for all the years in the Kentucky Derby. And they've got a, a, a horse in a sad position. And on the side here, you name it. It's been tracked. So ever since 1875, uh, whether there were seven horses running or 20, <laughs> every single horse finished uh, last place in the Kentucky Derby. So I'm going I'm to buy a few of these because they're just fun. And that's what whiskey should be. And that's what horse station should be sometimes. So you've got, you've got this guy. I don't know. I think I paid six bucks for it uh, in, in eight weeks at Kroger. That was 79 cents. And then I, I paid this one for a dollar when I, when I bought some whiskey. So uh, some, some fun barware to have. Names of these last place finishers are great. I like 1985's uh, I Am The Game, where he decidedly proved that he, he was not the game. So. One question that we got coming in that Emily passed on, it said, why are certain whiskey bourbons so hard to track down? Two short answers. First of all, oh, good gravy. Has bourbon gotten hard to find? With so many brands out there, some are, are ridiculously hard to find. The first answer is short, a little economics 101, uh, supply and demand. So you know, if someone has a 20-year bourbon out there and they're finding amazing success with it and they said, we got to make more of it, if they up production, triple, quadruple production that day of that 20-year bourbon, it's still 20 years before it hits the market to get out there. So it's really hard to adjust your uh, production line if all of a sudden you have a bourbon out there that's through the roof that everyone wants. Even if it's as little as a four or six-year age bourbon, still the different steps you need, the maturing, bottling, all that stuff. So it's hard to keep up with supply and demand, especially when there's a bourbon boom. When there's a bourbon bust, guys like me really like that because all of a sudden that 17-year-old bourbon that people don't want to pay so much for anymore is, is a lot less expensive and a lot more delicious. So that's another thing. They don't want to overproduce uh, because there's a demand now. So that's part of it. Second part is this infamous three-tier system we have in most parts of America. In most states, and it varies from state to state, um, in Texas, there's a fourth tier. In other states, it's all government. Most bottles of liquor from the distillery, the distributor, liquor store, bar, restaurant, what have you. And through those three steps, a lot of things happen as far as 
inventory, as far as politics, as far as pricing, as far as availability. And some of the smaller brands sometimes get left out of being able to find distribution. Massachusetts, for example, isn't one state you have to get into. It's broken up into five districts. So if you're a small brand, like say Willet, where you're family owned and you don't have an army of other brands like Diageo, who owns uh, that we'll get to, they own Crown Royal, uh, they own Terminal Vaca, Tangeray goes on and on and on. That they're hard to find the time and effort to get in those five states. So the reason some whiskeys are so hard to find, supply and demand, and that, and that three-tier system. That, that's another one <laughs> I talk about my friends at 2 a.m. at the bar. Who's ready for the second four? I, I can't see your hands. All right, we're going to put this one aside. Goodbye, Elijah. Can I find some super heavy? And we're going to move on to Russell's Reserve. We're going to spend a little bit of time on this one. This is a good one here. Let me put this guy aside. Get some fresh ice. I hope everyone's having a wonderful evening. I hope you guys are having as much fun as I. This is always hard because I'm used to doing these in front of people, so it's it's difficult not being able to see uh, your reactions. But hopefully, I'll get some questions, and who knows? Maybe we'll do this again, or maybe you'll have some buddies, and we can get together and do this. All right. So this is Russell's Reserve. Now, you may not be familiar with this bourbon, but you should be. Russell, the Russell's Herbs, takes the name from two gentlemen whose name is both on the label, Jimmy Russell and Eddie Russell. And uh, it says Jimmy Russell is a Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame, master distiller. And it says Eddie Russell is a Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame. Yes, we do have a Bourbon Hall of Fame. What it doesn't say anywhere on this bottle, except back here, is that this is a product, the Wild Turkey Distillery. And that is a very deliberate decision. This product um, is very different from Wild Turkey 101. I don't think they want any confusion or preconceived notions of how you might feel about Wild Turkey 101. Uh, I don't know, Matthew McConaughey, Evil Knievel, Hunter Thompson, Rough and Tumble, uh, Blow Your Ears Off Whiskey. I, again, have been at uh, Russell's Reserve, and I've been there. Eddie Russell was in the gift shop hanging out, and a guy came up, and he said, Eddie Russell, it's a pleasure. And they said, thank you. It's nice to meet you. He goes, I got so drunk on the 50-yard line in high school on Wild Turkey 101. And Eddie Russell just said, yep. Like, <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't the first time he's heard that story. So Russell's Reserve is a very different bourbon. And I'm going to tell you straight, and this is the second most important thing I want you guys to know about. I have been down this road before. A great example is Eagle Rare. And I could see the writing on the wall. I could see the word getting out. I could see the popularity. And I could say, this is a bourbon that's available now. But my fear is, my concern is that 18 months from now, two years from now, it's going to be hard to stock in shelves. You'll start seeing less of it. You'll see stickers that say they're temporarily out. And then before you know it, it'll, it'll be a ghost, like so many other ones have happened in the last few years. Henry McKenna's back, but Henry McKenna's tenure was an example of that. Like I said, Eagle Rare. Williams is one, Weller, um, and I, it's just too good. <laughs> this whiskey is just too good for the price, and it's it's a very well kept secret. Um, and no one's trying to keep it a secret. No, no one would make nothing would make the Russells happier than if everyone and their brother had this in their liquor cabinet. But, um, it's tremendous. So, what makes it so good? Well, you like what you like, and this is just something I like. I like whiskeys that have a nice little bit of rye bite, rye flavor, hits you in the side of the tongue. I think what's undervalued is it's right there on the label. It's a 10-year-old whiskey. And um, those are becoming, the good 10-year-old whiskeys are becoming harder and harder to find for a good price. And again, this one, I think, cost me $37 today at a Kentucky liquor store. It shouldn't cost you more than $43. Um, and it, it's tremendous. It's made the quality. So let's taste. That was a good cork pop. Did you hear that one? They come through on the headset? Hmm. Someone asked, what is the best bourbon at Circle Bar? My friend, it's been so long since I've been to Circle Bar, and I got bad news for you. My haunts when I was in lovely Oxford, Ohio, uh, were Mac and Joe's, Skipper's, and uh, various other spots, CJ's, and I was not drinking whiskey back then. If I was, and I had started earlier, the amount of knowledge I would have built up would have gotten me... Ten talk show or something. Uh, I, I wish I had started my whiskey journey a little sooner. I'm sure they have bourbon at Circle Bar. They probably don't at Steinkeller. Emily, are these still places? Emily says, I think so. He says, yes. That's good news. All right. So speaking of Miami, for this one, I'd like to raise a glass to Miami University's only alumni president, the great Benjamin Harrison. But this one isn't for Benjamin Harrison. When he was at the White House, 
He had a pet goat. To my knowledge, he was the only president who had a pet goat living at the White House. It was his son's, but you know, I mean, Benjamin Harrison paid to feed and take care of the goat. So here's the old whiskers. Benjamin Harrison's pet ghost who lived at the White House to the only Miami University alumni president who also had a pet goat at the White House. Cheers, everyone. Another one I like about this, and I know that we're not here for the tasting notes, and I want you to taste what you get out of it. But I love the finish on this. It has a nice full palate, and then it has a nice smooth finish. We never like to say burn, because that always implies that it's bad alcohol, or maybe that it's too high proof. We like to say it's giving you a nice tucky hug. That's what we call that nice strong finish through the throat, where it kind of warms you up. A whiskey sweater. Those are two of the ways I've described it. So you really feel like you're sipping whiskey, and it's good to sip in it in that way, to appreciate that each pour and have a sip of it. So it's got a bold front flavor, and a nice thorough, uh, but smooth enough finish, nice, nice uh, Kentucky hug, whiskey sweater. That could be the name of your tribute to you, my friends, next time you go out, the Kentucky hug, whiskey sweater. I really like this. Russell's makes some um, wonderful, I'm um, the wild turkey, and their small batch line, Russell's has some wonderful products. And I worry, uh, look for this, they also have a single barrel offering that's a little more expensive. And uh, uh, keep an eye out, because I, I, I fear it's gonna, I fear it's going to disappear. And I sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. Uh, but uh, I've, I've been right more than I've been wrong on bourbons I really appreciate and that have, that have gone away. One thing that's also the death nail of bourbon availability is there'll be a, a hoity-toity uh, competition like the San Francisco Spirits Awards. They take this seriously. If you're a gentleman, you're not aware, well allowed to wear cologne. The ladies can't wear perfume. You dress in all white. I, I think you wear goggles for some reason. Uh, they have some of the most renowned tasters there. They're very good at what they do. When they start handing out the awards, the distilleries run with them. They get the press. All of a sudden, the, the bourbon tends to disappear from the shelf. So something to keep an eye on. Somebody asked, what is the effect of adding water to your bourbon? That's a great question. Um, drink bourbon any way you like. I like mine with one big cube of ice in there. One of the reasons I do like that is because over time, as the ice melts, it does add water. The water, water molecules get in there, and they essentially break up the bourbon. So aside from the effect of diluting your bourbon and giving it a little different flavor by bringing down um, the alcohol proof, the content in that way, it also actually gets in there, and on a molecular level, will really kind of dispense some of the alcohol and, and, and give it a different flavor. A lot of people who do professional tasting take eyedroppers. And they put two or three drops of water in, and just that, drinking it neat, will, will significantly change the flavor, especially if you have a, a fine palate. Great question. Love the great questions. Cheers. Are you guys having fun? I'm having fun. I know my knucklehead alumni friends who have joined having fun. Hey, I promised you might have noticed that in the supply list of what you wanted to bring tonight, I said to bring droop waffles. The Dutch treat that's conquered the world, yonder, here, there, is Drupal. I also said Oreos are perfectly acceptable. And if you can't get Oreos, Hydrox. And if you can't get Hydrox, well, I will, you need to live in an area that's got better food options. So I we're going to have Stroop waffles. It was kind of a fun thing just to have, but I have a good point to, to why I wanted you to try and seek this out. I, I always feel that whiskey, and this isn't just for bourbon, this is for Canadian whiskey, all North American whiskeys, Japanese whiskey, Scotch whiskey. It's the short end of the stick when it comes to pairing with food, whether it's in restaurants, whether it's people's preparations or servings. I mean, we do wine pairings like they're going out of business. Beer pairings have been popular. But where's the food pairings, my friend? And there's a lot to be said about taking the kind of the signature flavors that you find in bourbon. You know, people say everything from earthy notes. The leathery toast, the tannins, to you know, you hear people say grass, and of course, sweet, uh, vanilla. It, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, spicy, clove, and pairing them with food. And so it's getting better. Uh, there's restaurants who finally jumped in the bandwagon. Some around here in Louisville have been doing it for a long time. Uh, we have a great place called the Bourbon Bistro, often credited as kind of the first to planning a, a bourbon menu around different whiskeys. Um, Bernice, that's a restaurant that does it too. More and more pop up. A lot of them have theme nights and I'm seeing expand to different cities like I've seen in Cincinnati, in Columbus, and Nashville. I want to encourage all of you, if you guys drink bourbon, to do something and try make with a Stroopwafel. This was an accidental discovery about four and a half weeks ago. 
for some reasons unbeknownst to me, we happen to have some stroopwafels around the house, maybe because my six-year-old son likes saying the word stroopwafel. It is a ridiculously fun word to say. And uh, one night I was hungry for a late night snack and I was having a nightcap of whiskey and I pulled one of these out and the flavor pairing was phenomenal. They have a caramel center and a, you know, you guys know these are, and like a little biscuit on the outside and it matched incredibly well. And I wouldn't have found that if I hadn't discovered a match with other things. There's certainly been some failed attempts at, at matching uh, snacks with whiskey. The point is, put a try, Pay more attention to restaurants that seem to have a solid whiskey menu that are doing different whiskey dinners and, and themes and chefs who are experimenting and give it a try. So uh, the, to the to the Stroop Waffle, that's what we're gonna, right? not cheers to the Stroop Waffle. That'd be just a weird, I'm gonna, now if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna have a, a moment of zen over here by a sip of this and close it. I brought four. Oh, I'm not even gonna pour Stroop Waffles. What are you talking to? Good. Make the next half hour me eating Stroop waffles and looking at you, but this might be the last one of these I do. Hmm. Outstanding, truly. A good combo. A good time to point out that I'm rocking the uh, Miami coaster. I'm all up in the love and honor night. Why drink with Miami people if you don't have Miami coasters? Who wearing others either? Magical things show up in my house. Oh, hmm, very good. Another great thing is that um, question people ask, often ask me. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's more sticky and strip awfully than I anticipated. that people often ask me is, what's your go-to bar call? You go out to a restaurant that's got, or, or a bar that's got a well-stocked bourbon selection, you don't want to take too much time thinking about it, and you know you're likely not going to get hosed at the price, what do you recommend? And I have two answers to that. One is the Russell Reserve 10, and the other is four rows of small batch. That's another one that's exceptional for the value, and um, it's just about every well-stocked bar or restaurant in America. So those are, those are two I really like. All right. Shall we move on to numeral three? We're rocking right along here, aren't we? Excellent. The question that came over, this is a good one too. These are top notch questions. Does higher price point equal higher quality? Is it related to the aging process? Oh man, loaded question. Like you're like you're reading my notes. Um, no. <laughs> higher price point does not mean higher quality. I am a firm believer and I have a, I have a mantra and it's, it's, it's tattooed uh, right on my back in, in, in Comic Sans 72 font. And it says that 90% of bourbons worth your time and worth drinking are under $100. So there's a lot of people who are charging a fair amount of money for a bourbon based on factors that may not have anything to do with quality. So no, higher price point does not always equal higher quality. Now your second part of that, is it related to the aging process? Yes. Some distilleries feel that if you can stick a large number on the front, 16, 17, 20, 23, in terms of years, they can charge one of these and a leg to get you to pay for it. So often one of the criteria they try to get you with is say limited availability, a one-time release, um, a high age statement, came from a famous distillery, something of that nature. Now, I wanna be clear, I'm not talking about Charitable releases where you're paying a lot, but it's often going for a good time. Perhaps a bottle select that was done on behalf of charity or these kind of one time annual releases. A popular one is Old Forester's Birthday Bourbon, but they try to break out the very best they have in their rickhouse and put it out once a year, September 2nd on the founder's birthday. Every year is different and they usually knock it out of the park. It's usually a tremendous bourbon. And that's over $100. I honestly believe that 90% of the time when you see those higher priced bourbons at retail, we're charging you for yeah, I, I don't think you're getting the quality associated that you would for a 30, 50, 70, 80, or even $90 bottle. And the aging is a big part of it. Another thing people don't realize is that it is absurdly easy for bourbons to become overaged. It's not like scotch. Because of the different climates and the different way scotch ages, you can age scotch for 30, 35, 40, 45 years. In America, especially in Kentucky, when you're aging bourbon, you, you, 
you can hit about 23, 24, 25 years, and that's about it. Not only do you lose so much to evaporation in the warehouses, what we call angel share, it becomes incredibly oaky. It starts retaining all the flavor of the wood in the barrel, all that time going in and out. It's difficult to make a well-aged, tasty bourbon over about 21 or 21 two years, depending who you ask. I've heard people say they wouldn't drink anything as old as 15. I've heard 20, 21. Um, you know, it, I can't do a presentation without Pappy Van Winkle coming up, but they've really done the sweet spot in finding a, a tasty bourbon that ages 23 years. These wheat instead of rye, that probably has something to do with it. For the most part, you can overage bourbon really fast when you get past that 23, 24, 25. So to that point, aging doesn't necessarily make it better either. Well, guess what I'm saying to answer your question? Don't place too much value of a bottle of bourbon based on the sticker price and don't put too much value over the bottle of bourbon based on the number of years that they're bragging about on the front. Like what you like. Well, I'm not saying don't try it. I'm just saying it, it twice before you, before you drop too much money on a bottle of bourbon. I'm glad we had that moment. I feel it's a culture. Good culture All right. Where are we? Number three. Goodbye there, Russells. Once again, feel free to connect with me on social media. Seems like a good time to put that up there. At Derby City Phil. On Instagram and Twitter. Oh, I did want to share something with you guys. I was all excited because my global pandemic pastime has tried to be create perfect, crystal clear sphere, crystal clear ice spheres. You know, like the giant ice cubes, but spherical and see through, like fancy bar time. And I did it, and I mastered it. And guess what? It didn't work for tonight. So I had an abomination instead. In the name of good humor, to show you I'm as fallible. And as a whiskey novice, everyone else, uh, this was the, the product. And then it got stuck to another ice cube. So I had, it's really melting fast. <laughs> so I got half a crystal clear ice cube. I swear I've done them and they look great. And I'll, next time we do one of these, I'll tell you the whole process and my secret. But no secret to share tonight. It, it didn't go so well. Maybe there's an ice sculpture artist who wants to buy this from me. We're probably not. Ah, oh. Rubik's Cubes. And ice spheres. Those are my global pandemic projects. Roughly. So moving on to the third whiskey. Tonight we're gonna do with a bullet rye. Now there is a reason we taste the three in the order that we tasted them. Some of it has to do with proof. It clocks in at 94 proof. This one it clocks in uh, right at 90 proof. So you always wanna go lower to higher proof, but those are about the same. So I did Elijah Craig because it's a nice one to start with, and this is kind of this. But we wanted to end on this one because this rye, bullet rye, is going to be so very different from the other two. It's going to have such a different flavor profile. It's going to kind of, I don't know, it might change your taste and senses for the other one. So it's a terrific one to end on. And we got a lot to say about bullet rye. First of all, what's rye? Phil, I thought this was a bourbon tasting. What are you doing? We're not in Tennessee whiskey. We're going to bullet rye? Where's your head at, Phil? Who invited you? Did you really graduate from Miami? Yes. So rye whiskey and bourbon whiskey have a lot in common. The main difference, and it's essential, between bourbon whiskey and rye whiskey is bourbon whiskey is essentially a corn whiskey. By law, if you want to bottle bourbon whiskey, it has to be distilled from at least 51% corn. It's usually about... 60 to 80% corn, and the rest of it is made up of a combination of either rye or wheat, sometimes both, malted barley, yeast, and water. Rye whiskey, just flip it. It has to be a majority of rye grain, 51% or higher of rye grain. That's about where the similar differences end, but then there's a lot of wiggle room there. Bullet rye is 95% rye grain. That's almost all of it is made completely rye, so it's a rye whiskey. Um, Woodford Reserve's rye is like, I think, 55 or 60 percent. So the rye content, it varies so much in a way that corn content does in a bourbon, really kind of changes the flavor of it. Bourbon's had a renaissance, as you guys all know. Bourbon's back in a big way. Fifteen years ago, bourbon was on the back porch. Rye was on death's door. The only one who was drinking rye were the old man at the end of the bar and people who have a diehard affinity for it. And then rye saw a resurgence. Where did it start? Place, so, you know, just like anywhere else with the tastemakers, the ones who know and love the product. In this case, it was the bartender. I used to have a bartender named Jimmy, and he wore like baseball tees, and then he became James, and he grew a mustache, and he, and he wore hipster clothing, and he juggled clothes. He's my new old friend Jimmy, new friend James. 
it's all about this because this is a bartender's tool. This is the best friend. There are so many great cocktails you can make with rye whiskey and especially bullet rye. And uh, when cocktails, whiskey cocktails also had a resurgence, rye wrote the cocktails and went right along for the ride. So we'll talk more about it. Uh, we, we haven't had anything to drink in a little bit. So let's, let's fix that. I'm not going to use my terrible ice cube. I'm going to use just a regular ice cube. Thank you. Honestly, great way to spend a Saturday night. Thank you guys so much for taking time from where you're doing it and joining us. This is a lot of fun. So this third toast, we've been focusing on Miami alumni. We had Dr. Philip Shriver and then Benjamin Harrison. This is going to be to Wally Zerbiak. And, you know, I don't know who's on this thing. I'm thinking there's a decent, a fair to middling, I don't know, 50, 75, 80% chance. But the Wally has joined us tonight. Uh, maybe he can enter a question in the chat and let us know he's there. But, you know, that was a contemporary of Wally was there. He my school to the Sweet 16 so, uh, with March Madness in the books and, and seeing him on a lot on TV. Uh, Miami, I had done good. Um, he just seems like a stand-up guy. Someone told me he's doing, uh, like, post-game color commentary for the Knicks. So he might be working tonight. He might not be doing this. Because the question was raised, what does he do when March Madness is in all? Either way. Miami University's uh, Wally Zerbiak, one of, one of the players you've had. Cheers. Hope you're, hope you're part of this today, Wally. So instantly, and if I had a camera, I bet I could see some of your faces making what is the whiskey face. Like, oh, if you haven't had a while. Very different than the other two. Not smooth in the same way, almost smooth in a different way because it's got a clean, quick finish. But at the same time, it lingers, right? It lingers in the side of your mouth, a little bit in your roof. Very different. Those are all the rye notes. That's what you get for a rye. Bullet itself is an inching brand, inching story. We we talk about uh, Jim Beam and legit 1795. The the first Jim Beam guy was setting up a still in Washington County, Kentucky, and you know became a commercial brand. Um, not that long after, the Samuel's family Maker's Mark goes back a long way. A lot of people along uh, distilling history. Not bullet in the same way. They are owned by the world's largest spirits maker, which is Diageo, which I mentioned earlier. Venice, Smyrna, Tangeray, Crown Royal, goes on and on and on. And what happened was that I think my best guess is Diageo was in the market to get involved with the bourbon industry because they didn't have at the time signature bourbon they could really get behind. At the same time in Kentucky, there was this gentleman named Tom Bullet, and his great Great grandfather Augustus Bullet. This is the part of the presentation I feel like it's time to say that in Kentucky, we like our whiskey on the rocks and our whiskey stories with a pinch of salt. So, you know, use your own adventure on how much you want to believe it. Tom Bullet says his great, great, great grandfather Augustus Bullet was the frontiersman who had his own secret recipe for making whiskey. And he did that, and it got passed down from time to time. When it ended up in his hands, he decided one day to give up his career as a lawyer. He was a veteran, and he decided, I'm going to get in the whiskey-making business, and he made Bullet. So there's Bullet Bourbon with the orange stripe and Bullet Rye with the green stripe. You'll notice that a lot of rye whiskeys are easy to spot on liquor shelves because they sport a green band or a green version of their original logo. Um, Tom Bullet will be the first to tell you, and – of a hat to them, kudos to them. They don't make their own rye. This isn't made uh, at a bullet facility, at a bullet distillery. This is made by a very well celebrated distilling operation called MGP. I think it's Midwest Grain Producers. And they have a facility in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, which I am certain, at least a few of you are intimately familiar with, right across the Ohio River, the stone's throw from downtown Cincinnati. Uh, back in the day, there used to be, as far as I knew, two things. Note in Lawrenceburg, sold uh, Seagram's plant in the casino. And the Seagram's plant became MGP, and they started producing whiskey for other people. You might not have heard of MGP because, for the most part, they don't release any of their own brands. They do a lot of contracting. And a lot of brands try to pass off a hogwash story of how they made it, um, and sometimes they even get some legal trouble. Well, to their credit, has been very straightforward in saying we lean on the expertise of another company who really makes rye whiskey better than anyone else in the world. And it's done them well. For years, Split Rye has been the number one selling rye 
with Key in America. And, uh, and it's only been on the shelves 12, 13 years. It's, it's not been a heritage product like these other ones. The reason I think Diageo acquired it is because they saw a lot of strength in the name and the brand. Well, it was already making inroads with, I think, bartenders, especially in California and cocktail makers. And they said, that is a brand that we can work with. It's got a cool name. It's Bullet. It's not like, again, Bullet. We're not advocating violence. It's a guy's name. And then they came up with Frontier Whiskey. There's no such thing as <laughs> Frontier Whiskey. It's not, a, it's not a type of whiskey. I can't tell you what makes Frontier Whiskey uh, different than any other types of whiskey out there. Uh, but they did this cool branding to make it feel like it's an outlaw. It's no coincidence. The, the bottle looks a little like a tombstone. They're one of the first to do that embossed glass that really sticks up. And if you put this on a, on a bourbon shelf with a light behind it, you can see this bottle from 10 paces. I guess what I'm trying to say is that Bullet Rye and Bullet Bourbon is a really slick combination of some quality rye whiskey that's in there. And I know it's not for everyone, but people who like rye really like rye. Some quality rye whiskey that's in there and also some, some good storytelling, some good markets and having the efforts with them. Um, Bullet, he, you know, he never claimed to be a master distiller. If you if you call him a master distiller, he'll put his hands up and stop you. He's the brand's he's the brand's founder. He's the one who established it. Uh, you know, who's involved with it for a long, long time. They relied on the strengths of others. Uh, a lot of distilleries now Bullet has their own distiller out in Shelby County, and a lot of distilleries out and brag on their master distiller. They've got uh, someone. I think I've said this last time, but when you're the master distiller, part of your job description these days isn't only being able to make world class whiskey and being able to be intimately familiar with every step of the distilling process, but you're expected to be a brand representative. You're expected to be comfortable doing interviews, making appearances, signing bottles. And Diageo and Bullet uh, has decided to, to forgo that. Um, you've got Connor Driscoll and you have the, the Russells for this one. And uh, the, there's no master distiller with Bullet. The face of the brand is the bottle. Okay. Oh, another one. Oh. I like it. I like it a lot. I, I, I lean towards bourbons. I like the sweeter notes of bourbon, but every now and then, this is great. I think great in a cocktail. Maybe you guys are cocktail people. I my bourbon one of these. Pretty neat, but there are some amazing cocktail creations out there to be had. So. Oh, man. All right. What else did I want to talk to you about? Augustus Bullet. That's a great name. Wish my parents had mean. Name me. Augustus. Or just Bullet. One thing I wanted to point out is that rye whiskey and the difference between regular bourbon whiskey, it ages faster. So you probably heard before that you don't want to waste your time with any bourbon that's too young, under two years, two to three years. Old Crow is a great example. I think Old Crow is maybe it's Old Granddad. It aged three years, not a day longer. <laughs> but rye whiskey ages faster and better at a different rate than bourbon. So while I believe, don't call me on this, I think this is about five or six years um, being aged, you can get great rye whiskey in two to three years. Peerless Distillery has done that here. Willow Distillery in Bardstown has done that. The rye whiskey ages uh, at a bit faster and 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 with more complexity than than bourbon does. Bourbon, you need that time. And this is like the the third major truth I want to drop on you because there's a whole bit, and this happens every few years. There's a whole big new cycle about rapid aging whiskey. Uh, we can do it 18 minutes, but used to take 18 months, and it ebbs and flows. And as far as I know, and I'm waiting for someone to prove me wrong, there is no substitute for that time spent in a barrel um, for, for whiskeys. Rapid aging stuff, uh, it just leaves, comes up short. So that's, just, that's just my opinion. Maybe Wally Zerbiak has an opinion on that. Those are our three brands. This is to about 820. I wanted to make sure we all had a chance to taste so we could talk. I'm going to sip, and then we got some questions to get to because I want you guys to feel like you're learning something and enjoying something and, and enjoying this evening with us with Miami. So. And we got Shorter Day Ball stuff to get to. That's exciting. 1909. Miami was founded the same year Abraham Lincoln was born. That's my fun fact. All right. Uh, so there was a question earlier I wanted to get to because I have strong opinions about this. In case you haven't. Notice I have I have no trouble having strong opinions about things. And it says, hey, Phil, Hi. how do you feel about homemade bourbon? Would I recommend homemade distilling, especially in the greater Cincinnati area? <laughs> no, I would not. I wouldn't touch homemade bourbon 
with a 10 foot pole. I'm sure you're wonderful at making homemade bourbon. The challenge is it's very different from homemade beer. It's a complicated process. There's a tremendous potential for things to go wrong. You know, stills in the hill during the prohibition days and moonshiners sometimes exploded and it wasn't a coincidence. Um, there is a process in distilling where you have to cut out the front part called the heads and the tails. It's the first run that comes off the still. You want to get the heart of it. That's the best part of the whiskey that's coming off the still before you put in the bottles to age. I think the tails are just lousy tasting, but the heads have some components in there that can be on the acetone scale that can, that can make you sick and do you worse. I'm not saying your homemade whiskey is going to kill me, but I'm saying it could be awful. Uh, so uh, I, that is one I, I, I just leave to the professionals. It's largely illegal, as far as I know. You know, making beer at home has been legal since the Carter administration in the in the late 70s. But with the exception of, I think, Missouri allows you to distill something crazy like 10 gallons at home. You're, you're not allowed to make homemade whiskey. It could be you. I think that's great. I can't look you in the eye and say I haven't had homemade moonshine. I've had my share. It's, it's just generally... I mean, why would I do that when I could, for $35, get a really quality product on the shelf? I'm not really uh, all that interested in, in, in your homemade bourbon. But thanks. I hope it worked out for you. What distillery is your favorite to visit? There are so many great ones if you come and tour the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. Now, keep in mind, bourbon doesn't have to be made in Kentucky. Great distilleries are popping up all over the country. Uh, High West, uh, Kings County Distillery in New York, um, down in West Virginia, uh, Smooth Ambler, and of course, all the ones in Tennessee. But along the uh, Kentucky Bourbon Trail, you know, we've got more and more stops every year. There's more to have, and there's a lot of them I like, but two of them just make my heart go pitter patter. Two of them I, I just find exceptional. Two of them I'm glad every time I'm there, and that's Buffalo Trace and, and Maker's Mark. And at Maker's Mark, they could be making rubber glue down there, and you won't find a prettier place. It's nestled into a tiny town of Loretto, Kentucky. They've got, I think, close to 600 acres. They buy more around it. It's on the National Landmark of Historic Places, National Historic Land. Anyway, it, it's, it's just gorgeous, and it's a great tour. And the care and efforts they put into the grounds is, is second to none. And it's good bourbon, a great story. So Maker's Mark, and then Buffalo Trace is just a personal favorite. It's industrial cool. It's the oldest continually operated bourbon distillery in the U.S. Uh, they haven't shut down for anything. They made it through Prohibition, a couple of wars. Uh, there's these new buildings, you know, new bottling hall that was opened just, I think, last year next to Old stone warehouses from the 1880s. The people that work there are fantastic. The brands are great and their tours are free. So uh, there, there's a lot out there, but I'm going to say uh, Buffalo Trace and Maker's Mark. You know, but that's not fair. Let me give you a small one also because those are the two big guys. I, I wasn't going to keep it a one. One thing that's also I think is great because these small ones are so different where you might end up a tour with Master Distiller where there's five people there and the person in charge of, you know, bottling that day is also giving your, your, your tour guide. So I'm going to go ahead and give a shout out for Kentucky Peerless Distillery. Louisville. There's a lot I could choose from, but you'll probably run into one of the two owners there. And that, that's a fun one also. Okay, we'll see what other, uh, what great general tips for bourbon drinking beginners? Like riding a bike, baby. My wife uh, had her own uh, bourbon beginner drinker journey. And it's a matter of try it at your own pace. Try different things. Try it with ice. Try it with water. Try it neat. Try it in a cocktail. Try different brands. Um, don't force yourself to like it. Uh, don't let anyone tell you what you should like. Um, try it. That's general advice. I feel like I just gave you good advice for learning how to drive a car in NASCAR. Let me give you some more specific advice. Start with stuff that's lower proof but full bodied. By law, it can't be bottled at any less than 80 proof. There's a lot of bad brands that skim the bottle. And I'm not talking about Jim Beam and Evan Williams. Those those are 80 proof. But there's other ones that are that are worse. So look for some that are known to be high quality, sippable bourbons at 80. A good one that a lot of people talk to that's perfect for when dipping their big tone of whiskey is Basil Hayden. So the worst thing, Basil Hayden, the worst thing you can do as a new bourbon drinker, go right for the heart and hearty stuff, the barrel strength, the 110 proof, 115, 60% alcohol. That'll knock you on your backside and you won't enjoy a drop of it. So start with full flavored, low proof bourbon. That's some practical advice to, to get into that. Excellent. Um, Another question that I got that I was hoping I had time for, and I'm glad I do because it allows me to give, pain. to give another plug for a business that's worth visiting, and it's very unique. It said, have you visited Justin's House of Bourbon 
in Lexington to see their trophy case collection. Yes, I have. I'm glad someone asked about that because I would not have thought to mention Justin's House of Bourbon. But this shows that the word's getting out there and people are aware of it. Justin's, plural, in an apostrophe because they're Justin's, took advantage of an incredibly unique law that passed in Kentucky just a handful of years ago. And that allowed for vintage bottle sales. Well, what does that mean? That means that if I invaded my grandpappy's closet and he had these sealed, unopened bottles of wild turkey from the 1970s, the state of Kentucky now allows me to sell them to a bourbon licensed bar, liquor store, retailer, restaurant, uh, with just a simple document. They could buy it from me unopened uh, at any price they choose. So Justin's House of Bourbon was very aware of this. I think they might have been in part instrumental in helping the law get passed. And they opened a liquor spot, Johnny on the spot. It's like no liquor store you've ever seen. And I mean that in the best ways. It is honestly a whiskey history museum where every bottle is for sale. Every bottle has a price. You may not want to pay it, but everything you see has a price. And their collection is phenomenal and is jaw dropping. I've seen bottles I never thought I'd see. I've seen bottles I didn't think existed. And I've been fortunate enough to taste a few things I never thought I'd get to taste. So even if you're just a looky loo and have no intention of buying, uh, just in South Suburban, they now have two locations, Louisville, Lexington. And I imagine as the restrictions ease, there'll be more of these vintage whiskey spots kind of opening up masses to come and visit where they allow people to buy old and open bottles of bourbon from private individuals. Um, it's, it's a cool spot. And even if you don't want to drop an arm in a lake, if reasonable price bourbon bottles too are stuff that's just a little higher than it's hard to find. Ian is a great guy that works there. Jeremy is a great guy there. Mention my name, Phil. Mention my name when you go in there. And um, they'll add a 20% surcharge to any of the No, I'm just kidding. Mention me when you go in there and then ask, I heard maybe there's a, a secret room. There might be. Right, let's see what other questions we got here. Those are terrific questions. I feel like I have plants in the audience. Oh, what are some rare or some really special bourbons? I love that one. Um, what's rare is what's rare to you. And what's special, that's not true. What's rare is what's got the high price tag that no one feels like paying. What's special is what's special to you. What's special to me? What's a really special bourbon to me? For me, it's a bourbon called Elmer T. Lee. And it has the added benefit of being both rare and special. It used to be, once again, probably going back about eight or nine years ago, it's pretty easy to find on shelf. And I can't tell you why. I can describe the tasting notes I can get about it. I can describe what I like about it. Um, I can't tell you why it's my one of my favorites. I don't have a favorite. But I can't tell you why it's so special to me. Uh, I can just tell you that it hits me in a way that I enjoy. I always, I always feel like I'm enjoying it. And I've also, and this is important, I've shared it in, with some really great company, with some really great people. And I have really fond memories of polishing off a bottle of Elmer Tilly or trying it with, with various friends from various places. But that one's really special to me. As far as something that's special, uh, generally considered, that comes out that's kind of unique and special, um, whenever the Willet, I mentioned them a few times earlier tonight. Family owned distillery out of Bardstown puts out one of their family estate releases that's on the older side, seven years or 10, 12. And there's plenty of those bottles out there. They've ended up going for a pretty penny. So if you ever end up having an opportunity to see or taste one of those, uh, that, that's a good one too. There's also been recent changes to the Kentucky Owl brand. So I think older bottles of Kentucky Owl are going to start to be considered very special for very long and elaborate reasons that we don't, we don't have time for tonight because we got we got a charger ball to get there. Look at this. It feels like I'm doing it. Let me bring the other guys back in here. Come on, guys. Come on, Colin. I got a good here, too. Hey, how was your whiskey presentation? Good. Post started talking to the bottles to the end, and that kind of got a little strange. They look colorful. They look good, don't they? All right, we're going to do one or two more questions, and then we'll let you guys get to your charity ball. Whatever your Saturday evenings might, might have planned. Everyone have a good time? Look forward to us all being uh, social media friends. And of course, if you think of a question the next day and you want to reach out, I, I'll write you back. I enjoy this. Phil at philtalkswhiskey.com. And, uh, yeah. You can visit my website. It's, it's, it's underwhelming. It's got some pretty photos on it. And I do fun things with whiskey. All right, let's see. Oh, I have a bourbon from 2013. Forgiven Wild Turkey. Is it good? <laughs> Hi, these are such awkward questions. 
like I, I used to get these on tours a lot, and um, usually people wouldn't ask them to the end of the tour. We'd hit a lot of the stories. I retired. Just say, yeah, great. So, uh, given is a is a great story. Is it good? That's totally your call. I'm not here to tell you whether your whiskey is good or not. Is it perceived as good by the industry? It's a mixed bag. It's um, it's got the story of how one distillery employer, employee, while took us to massive facility, they don't do very much in small quantities. It's all massive runs, and they were going to. I'm going to butcher the story because it's a few years old, but they were going to make. Bourbon one day, but there was rye in the tank, and they started the bourbon making process, but they didn't have a rye grain. It was a terrible error on the operator's part of the distillery at the time. But when the master distiller, Eddie Russell, tasted it, he was so impressed, he instantly said she was forgiven. And they went to market with this unique release. It was a combination of grains they have on that. The unique release is kind of the key word I can give to you. I've had it. Um, it didn't hit my palate, particularly in a memorable way. I didn't dislike it, but I didn't clamor for more. But I hope you like it. It's all about what you like. That's the most important thing, my friend. Ah, ha, ha, ha. This is my, my favorite question of the night. How was Buffalo Trace able to remain open during Prohibition? If you take the tour, get to this in short, short order. They kind of do what I did. I mentioned they're the oldest continued operating bourbon distillery. And then they pointed to this great poster that showed all the distilleries that have closed over the year in Kentucky. And when I started doing this, there was only a handful, maybe 14 that were open. Now there's so many, given the expansion, probably. Think of that. And those are places you can visit. There's even more that are closed to the public. So how are they open to remain during the distillery? And if you look at the poster, a lot of them say closed to Prohibition. And about halfway through Prohibition, which was a messy time, I encourage anyone to read a good book on what an overwhelming debacle Prohibition was. Bad idea from the start, bad idea in the middle, bad idea. The only time a constitutional amendment has been passed to rescind people's rights, to tell people they can't do something. And the only time another constitutional amendment has been passed to undo a previous one. So loopholes were found left and right. And in Kentucky, along with other states, a number of permits were given for medicinal whiskey. Parallels to today, does it not? The Buffalo Trace clamored. They got one of the distillery and one of those permits that allowed them to, there were six, uh, Buffalo Trace wasn't the only one, but they're the only one still in their original location with that same, what's called a DSP number, making whiskey uh, throughout the 1930s. And they were able to produce whiskey, had to be, a, a, I think it had to be 100 proof, and you could only get it from a note from your doctor and to go to a pharmacist. There's a great tour guide at Buffalo Trace, his name is Lee, and he said during Prohibition, injuries were, Nagging and never ending. Oh, my sore thumb is tearing up again. I think I need a whiskey. And you're allowed, I think, a pint of whiskey every 10 days for every man, woman, and child in your house. And in some states, not in Kentucky, that's what you needed to do. So Buffalo Trace was able to thrive um, because of uh, medicinal whiskey, which was allowed in Kentucky and some other states. Crazy, right? 90 years ago. And, uh, you know, that's kind of where we were. All right, we're going to do one more question, and we're going to call it tonight. And I once again, I'm going to say thank you guys so much for joining me. I'm going to raise one more glass to you guys, one more of the, of the bullet ride. I hope I answered all your questions. I hope I went down the trail of everything I said I'd start talking about because there's so much great information I want to share with you. Remember, like what you like, drink what you enjoy. Remember, never spend too much on a bottle of whiskey. And as uh, a, a great guy I know, his name's Freddie Johnson. He's in the Bourbon Hall of Fame. He's a tour guide. He's the only bourbon tour guide in the Bourbon Hall of Fame. He said, uh, an empty bottle of bourbon creates far more memories than a full bottle of bourbon. So make sure you share with you with the people in your life, even if you're just doing it, doing it virtually. All right, so let me get to one more question. And we'll call it a night. We'll turn them all up. And you find a good one. This is great. Uh, all that big uh, prelude and then... Uh, Let's see. I want to get a really good one. What do you look for when buying bourbon? And do you recommend any of the bourbon tours? What I look for, oh, man, one of my favorite hobbies is going to, to bottle shops. What I look for when I'm uh, going bourbon shopping is three things. One, like two or three looks to make sure that I want to spend this much money on a bottle I've not had just because they're already And three, and this is the key one, this is what we're going to end on. If you find a good liquor store, it's always worth looking on the higher shelves and looking in the back. Because when, well, you don't look in the back. 
you ask them to look in the back. Because when it comes to these bourbons that are rare, we toss around rare a lot, but it's more like they have distribution, they're getting out there, they're just flying off the shelves. And if most liquor stores are amenable and happy and you say to them, casually, kind of polite, hey, I was just wondering, do you have anything in the back that's not on display here that I might be interested in or unique? You never know. And that's how I end up with a bottle of Blam. That's how I always have a bottle of Blam, Tandy. I picked this one up at Kroger six weeks ago on a Tuesday when I asked the clerk, hey, I didn't see anything from Buffalo Trace, but I know sometimes you get anything. Would you happen to have anything in the back? He said, what are you looking for? And I said, I don't know, Eagle Rare? He goes, how about some Blantons? And this has become hard bourbon to find. It didn't used to be. And I paid 55 bucks for it. And that's a, that's the highlight of my whiskey shopping adventures in the last weeks. So what do I look for when I'm shopping for bourbon? I look for what I'm out of, what I'm interested to try for a reasonable price. And it never, it never hurts to ask, what might you have in the back that I might be interested in? Just a fair question. Now, caveat, if you live in what we call a control state, where the liquor stores are run and controlled by state agencies like Pennsylvania and a number of others, get that advice. <laughs> they ain't got, they, they'll do you no favors. They have no time for you. So this is only what we call the open states where the liquor stores are owned and run by, by private people like Thank you so much. This has been an honor blast. An honor blast. Love and honor to Miami. This has been a good time. Uh, connect me on social media. I hope we can do this again sometime. Cheers, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, just a reminder, go ahead and join us for um, Miami Traditions Virtual Charter Day Ball. You can find that link. Um, in, it's in the bourbon tasting um, registration page. So we have that really? link. It got, it got so dark where you are. I know, it is, I know, and I even have the lights on in my house. It is wow. very dark here. The lights didn't go out um, on me this time. Did you notice that? I know. I was, I was wondering that. <laughs> but again, um, please follow Phil on social media. If you have a question, go ahead and send him an email. If you aren't able to get his email, his website, or his social media, or you just want to reach out to him, go ahead and email me. You can find my email on the Miami alum website, and I will connect you with Phil. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Remember, head on over to the virtual Charter Day Ball um, and have a great rest of your evening. And thank you again, Phil. It's always, it's always so much fun to listen to you. Thank you, Emily. It was a blast. Love and honor.